This has been a long time waiting and we're very excited. Welcome to a dialogue across generations, making connections through the BLACC collection. We are so excited to feature this collection that was created from the 1980s into 2000. It was donated to us by Columbia Opportunities in 2018. And um, part of the reason it was donated to us was because of the work of Emily Shemitas and Quentin Cross and Tiffany Gariga to really place that collection in terms of the importance in Hudson and the fact that the library could be a good steward of the collection. So we're very grateful to them, and you will be too when you, when you explore it. Um, we did have this archived and digitized a great portion of this collection in 2019 because we received, in, into 2020, because we received a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which we're very grateful for. And this exhibition and the related programming is funded by Humanities New York uh, through their action grant. So as you can see from this exhibition, which is curated by Tanya Jackson. <laughs> it is vast, it is purposeful, and it's full of connections to local and national history. And many of you may be familiar with Tanya's annual Juneteenth uh, exhibition at Lightform's Art Gallery. Go ahead. Uh, we wanted to work with Tanya because of her vision, centering the lives of local black folks in history and the connections that arise. And I want to thank, I'm gonna, I need to take my glasses off. To <laughs> I want to thank Tanya for her vision yeah. because it really centers the people that this collection is about and it makes them alive in a way that I haven't just seen before. It's tremendous. So I'm very grateful. We knew who we wanted to work with and we did. And I feel um, one of the things that she spoke about is the trials are there. We know that. But she also always sees the joys. And that gives people the dignity that they deserve. So it's been a very moving experience. I also want to thank Elaine Eichelberger, who's our volunteer, one of our many for this exhibition. And Elaine and Patty Stroh. on the exhibition. And I want to thank Melina Kai for her time, talent, and skill in helping to mount this. Because when you, Tanya does an exhibition, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and there's many more people to thank on the wall. Our history room volunteers did a lot of research. A lot of the town historians answered questions that we had. and. So it does take a village to be fair to this collection. The folks represented on this wall are alive to us today because of all the people who created the collection, who helped to preserve it and make it accessible. And I want to just take a minute to speak about the association itself. Because when I say the Black Legacy Association of Columbia County Collection, I think about the collection kind of as an archivist. And I thought more over these days of the association. So I'm going to tell you who's in it. The agencies that made up BLACC were the Retired Seniors Volunteer Program, Columbia Opportunities, and Emily Shemitas would like me to read every, the name of every single person that was in that central committee. So Vivian Austin, Ella Barksdale, Jesse Cooper, Bernice Cross, Edward Cross, Helen Dago, Phoebe Eaton, Dandridge Harris, James Kerr, Gilbert Lewis, Ethel Loveless, Julia Minnesee, Eloise Moore, Marie Parker, Annie Pettin, Calvin Pitcher, Otelia Rayner, Grace Schwartzman, Leslie Stiles, Marion Vaness, Selma Vaness, William Vaness, Annabelle Waters, Bernard Weisberger, and Beulah Whitbeck. So that's the art. The other 
organizations were Worldwide Mission for Jesus Team, which was formerly the Black Ministers Alliance, the County Museum, the County Chapter of the NAACP, and Columbia Preservation, and the Columbia Green Community College, and the Minority Alliance at the college. And you're going to see a lot of information all the way to the back here on the left, well, my left, your right, that is about the formation and the administration of this uh, association. They propose to reveal a hidden legacy of Columbia County history. And the document that had that proposal in it continues, black residents helped to build it, meaning the county, form it, fought for it, worked in the whaling industry at the iron mines in Ancrum, in the many brickyards, and prayed for it in their churches. The historical record of how the blacks came here, what they did, how they lived, how they died, where they went to school, their social customs, their war efforts, their community involvement, their enclaves, their churches, their cemeteries, has never been explored and researched in depth." Unquote. So I feel like I'm talking a lot. There's a, there's a lot more that we could say. <laughs> My words could be like what's on the walls here. There's just so much to this collection. But I want you to know it's not all digitized. There's a lot more. There are things that each one of you could go into the history room, and you'll have the opportunity to do that tonight, and dive into the collection and find what is meaningful to you and bring something to light that we may not have seen also. It's a, it's a living collection. It really is. And there's open hours for our history room with our volunteers, Saturdays, 10 to 1. Wednesdays, 6 to 8, or by appointment, if you would like to view the collection. Um, we encourage you to listen to the oral histories on the BLACC library website. And uh, Tanya will say more about that. And um, also look at the images and documents which are on our history room website. The BLACC developed, um, the BLACC developed as a culminating project a syllabus for local schools, and that is right here. I mean, the, the work they did is amazing. And we have a youth workshop this Saturday from 12 to 2 that will be focused on the collection. It'll be a hands-on workshop. Please tell everyone you know who is seven and up, <laughs> but only up to 18. <laughs> and on Saturday, March 23rd, from 11 to 1, we have an educator workshop where we're going to introduce the collection's resources, both online and here, and everyone will get a copy of this syllabus. It was planned with passion to be used in the local school system, so let's make sure that that happens. Please, you know, tell the educators. There are listening stations that are set up in the library by the history room where you can come and just listen to the oral histories and also through our original grant, our digitization grant, we worked with the Community Library of Voice and Sound, um, which is uh, run by Oral History Summer School. Those collections will be in conversation with each other. Uh, the, Community Library of Voice and Sound is from the 2000s on, and Tanya will talk a little bit about the intergenerational connection between the two oral history collections. Mm -hmm. So please do uh, do that. And also, one of the things we said, there's so much here, and there's so many of you. Just come back, take your time, read. This is a wonderful space to learn in. And finally, please consider donating to the library. Anybody who donates tonight, uh, your money will be earmarked specifically to promote the BLACC collection. So I'm going to introduce the curator, Tanya Johnson. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Um, before I dive in, it is important that we always begin with our tradition of giving libations to the ancestors. 
And so I would like to bring up Ms. Elena Mosley, mm -hmm. who will lead us in a libation, and then we will get started with the formal program. and may have grown up here and walked around the room, I'm hoping that you adopted that energy into your soul for tonight because this is tremendous. And looking around, and if you don't know, you will know. But know that whenever we come together to honor our ancestors and we give a libation, it is with expectation that remnants of them, their spiritual being by themselves or through the ancestors of the people who are here and are not here comes alive. Mm -hmm. And that is what we're looking for. So I look, Helen Dago went to my church, but her daughter called me to give me the books from Ghana and things that she brought back. I did not know I would be here today. Mm -hmm. So there's connections going all the way around as we look and feel, and then know for the first time the people that are here. So to hear Annie Peden, who was the president of the NAACP when I first got active here, her spirit is here. Somebody that I know and will have known, it's all here together. Right down to Quentin Cross, his <laughs> picture is in the back from his high school yearbook. And that's his time that he spent at Operation United. So I'm just one person, but together, all of us mm -hmm. bring forth the energy. Mm -hmm. So for our ancestors, for the people who have come before us, and for you who bring forth their energy, this is to them. Mm -hmm. So we drop, and I like to pay tribute to the four corners of the earth, the north and the south and the east and the west, because we come from all of that. Mm -hmm. We come, we bring our energy and the particles. And if you're not a historian, tonight you will be. Mm -hmm. So we thank you for coming. And to our ancestors, on the count of three, please join me as we say ashe. One, two, three. Ashe. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn it over to our curator, Tanya Jackson. All right. I just came back from a trip. Um, my first time in the motherland, and it was so profound. And it wasn't just profound that I got to be there, it was profound that I got to be there with black people from this community. Most, if not all of us, um, had not had a passport, let alone go, go to um, the motherland of our ancestors. Um, and it was serendipitous and beautiful to have done that before coming here, but also very challenging because we had this <laughs> project to put on. But I think it was really important because it was able to root me in the energy that um, Elena Mosley spoke of. Um, we learned of um, what they went through and how they yearned for us and how we yearned for them. Um, and so um, I'm really heavy with joy I'm heavy with the pain, the things that we learned there, um, and then I'm very heavy with the hopefulness and the sheer will of spirit and the technology of our people to not just survive but thrive in the midst of the things that we have gone through, 
both there and here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I give thanks for this moment. I give thanks for this project. I give thanks to Brenda and her staff for inviting me in to be a part of this work. Um, this would not happen without them. They have spent hours, countless hours, outside of their work schedule to really um, bring this to life. And so I really want to thank you, Brenda, like your, your commitment. I mean, you don't want to know how late we were here last night. <laughs> um, but it also brought us into community with each other in a way that we hadn't been before. And so I'm really grateful to, for the time that we spent. And to Elaine, whose organization, I don't know how much Virgo you have in your chart, but her organizational prowess is like none other. Um, and, you know, the volume that you see here requires such technical know how, such organizational practice. And Elaine really helped us in our moments of angst mm -hmm. to really drop in and take one bite at a time. So I really thank you for your organizational skills. Mm -hmm. Patty, the volunteer who would run all over town for us and <laughs> do all of the little tedious things that are required. This is Patty, please give her a hand. It really, you know, while I'm being honored as the curator, this is not something I did alone, um, and I could not have done this without you all. Um, and to um, the library and the directorship who just gave room for us to breathe, and I really thank the way that you um, show up. Um, thank you, Emma. about what's in this room. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'm going to bring up some amazing people mm -hmm. who are going to, I'm going to step back and let them really bring it. Um, so the way that um, I thought about curating this was, um, if you have been to Juneteenth, I'm comprehensive. I want to say everything all together at once, and I want to do it immersively. And they said, it's a community room and it's active and you cannot take over the whole space. It has to be 2D. I was like, okay. Um, well, for some color. So what, you, what you're what you seeing here, um, going from clockwise left around, is to ground in the process that um, Brenda spoke about. So if you're really interested in what was this process of bringing this to life, you can go to that back wall, what we've, um, what we've highlighted, meaning there is a big box for each of these areas and we had to decide what to show. And so on that back wall, there are highlights that are um, some articles, but some of the actual memos, like if you were around in the 80s and the 90s and you know what an old school memo looks like and a typewriter <laughs> and you know, you'll be able to like, you know, have, you know, see that we really wanted to represent the artifacts as they were. Um, so if you want to know more about the process and the sheer volume and goals of this project, some of those elements are back there, and particularly there's a listing of goals. And what they had in mind for this was beyond what they were able to do, but the sheer desire to take on something during analog technology <laughs> of that magnitude is really moving to me. Right, um, and they're all el they're all elders. <laughs> like, really? Like, you know, we don't we don't we don't honor them enough. We don't honor and, and censor and hold our elders enough. And so I, I I hope that you can sit with the sit with that that these were all elders who took time out of their already long lived life to bring forth their own history. Um, it is really powerful. And then as you move around the room, um, we begin with the first interview and oldest um, member of the RSVP um, interviewee pool, which is Leslie Stiles. She was interviewed at age 98. Um, and she is the great grandmother of Mr. Quentin Cross. And the Cross family um, is centered um, a lot in this because one, a lot of them are interviewed, but also they have done so much work in this community um, generationally, um, and they deserve that that space and that honor. So I really thank the Cross family. I thank you. Um, as 
a young person in this community coming from Bliss Towers to have leaned into his own life, leaned into all of the struggles and all of the things we may or may not think we know about him, look at him now. And that is a testament to what does it mean to ride the ebbs and flows of life. team and, and Tiffany Green, I don't think she's here because you know they're constantly giving all of this tidbits about what is happening behind the scenes. So much about what happens in this community is happening behind the scenes and it's happening by black folks holding their community down, not being credited, not being seen for their work, things being taken from them. But there's grace and compassion because what it means to be a part of a movement work which we are in together is to censor the work over the ego. Mm -hmm. And I really honor and appreciate what they have done. Um, and for letting me kind of sneak away from work <laughs> to, act, to actually be with, the, with this project. Um, and we'll get in a, a bit more of that. And so, the, and so as it comes around, you'll be able to notice the connections between these folks. Their interviews may exist as these you know, individual thumbnails, but they knew each other. They were married into each other's family. They're going into each other's um, houses. They're having picnics. They're going to the same churches. And so when it comes to archival work and research and history, for me and for a lot of black folks, um, I want to <laughs> shout out my mom. Who <laughs> There, he's an ancestor now. Um, he was a professor um, at, at SUNY New Paltz, um, um, Myers Williams. And he, been, he wrote all of these books on black life in the Hudson Valley. And his focus was, um, part of the focus that led to this project was when we look at black history in the books, we are statistics, we are nameless, we are just, and when you'll see here, property deeded to someone. Um, and what he did with his life work was to look for the social relationships of black folks, to take them out of being just a number or someone's property, and to really make clear that while you may document us this way, and because it's repetitive, so you don't understand us except for this 2D number on the page, we are full lives, we are full people like anyone else. And I was really inspired when I um, discovered him and the way that he was writing theory and methodology to say, in order for us to understand black life, you have to understand that way that we live with each other. Mm -hmm. Not just the names or the dates or some famous person that did this, or was a prominent figure in this way. And a lot of times we're looking for prominent figures because so much of the history puts us in a place that makes us seem subservient. Someone has to save us. Someone has to do this for us. And that's not the case. And so what I have been moved and what the ancestors put on my heart as somebody from this community, my family moved here in the, in the mid 80s. I was about 10 years old um, and we were, in Quarryville and Philmont and some of these places, I was like one of those kids, one black figure in a room full of white kids. <laughs> and was like, where are the black people? Um, and somehow we, we found us, and I think through the Carters, who are another instrumental prominent family, um, and they introduced us to Hudson. And when we came to Hudson, um, I was so excited. <laughs> But then the black kids saw me as a new girl, and it was a whole other situation. <laughs> but it was still this experience that really helped me to reconnect. Because I came from the city, and in the city, you know, some of the things that we take for granted is how much black life and black culture you get to have when there's a dense volume of you there. And when you come to a rural context, you have to work at it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, fast forward, maybe five or six years ago, I came up here, my aunt was doing her plays and things, and I, you know, I'd come home for holidays and things like that, and every time I came home, this, the community was changing more. You know, Savoyas is closing. The little bit of things that we had to stay connected were fizzling out, and I would just be angry, and I would just be like, gentrification, and all of this, and all of this, and I remember one day, 
it was on my heart that, you know, you, you know, this community sent you away. I got to be formally educated. I got scholarships through this community. You know, Ms. Bunny, rest in peace, made sure that I was able to have a path to college and to go away. And I knew when I had when I decided to move back here that I wanted to love on this community the way that it loved on me. And I said I wanted to do something that was a love letter to this community. And I knew that you know my my professional passions have been media and history and cultural work and education. And so I was like, how can I use that when I come back? Which is how the Juneteenth exhibits began. It was like this is what I know that if I you know, as I, if I were coming up here now, I would want to know more about myself as a black person here. And I didn't see that. And so my job and what I think our job is to see what is missing and not just be feeling heavy about it, but to lean into that and do something about it. And so that's what led me to this work. And that's what led me to tonight. And so I'm so grateful to the ancestors, to my mom, to my family that modeled such ways for me. Um, and that's what you'll see throughout this room in this circular fashion. And it comes right back around and we'll get to Jaden Cross and the new generation um, in a minute. And so, without further ado, um, I wanna show you and we're gonna listen to a bit of an interview um, because the idea of this was we want people to not just know what's in the archive but to engage it, to have a dialogue with it, to have conversations with it, and to have that speak to your life and to understand and make these connections. And so this is the website. Um, there was the, um, the opening images and those were all of, these are all of the interviews that have been digitized. And you can click on any one of these, read a summary, and listen to the interviews. Most of them are about 40 minutes to an hour, a little bit over an hour long. Um, we're going to hear just a little bit from um, Ancestor Rayner. And you may have seen her outside in the hallway. So this exhibit is not just in this room, it's also in the hallway. Um, and in the hallway is a tribute to 433 State Street which I learned is our local Green Book location in which mm -hmm. folks from the South, particularly ministers, nurses, doctors, people who are coming up here to do work, abolition work, preach in the local churches, um, needed a place to stay. You know, we like to think that New York was, was not in slavery or segregation, but we, I hope we know now that that's not true. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Miss Rayner lived in this house at 433 State Street when she um, was in her um, maybe 20s, her younger days. She was living in the city. She was a cosmetologist. She came up here. Um, and what I also found out was this way that black folks up here were reaching back to the city and to the south and bringing and inviting family, friends, other folks who needed <coughs> better work, better situations to come up. There was a, there was you know, there, the, there was an underground railroad and that led into, we're doing this ongoingly where we're saving ourselves and we're making space for ourselves. And this home is a testament to that. It still exists today. It is still owned by the family that lived there for all of these generations and we're actually gonna get to speak to them. It's very, it's a, it's a treat. So I wanted to begin with, um, we're gonna play maybe the first three minutes. I don't know when to stop it. Where we'll hear her talk about this particular house um, and then we're going to, I'm going to invite um, members of the family of this house to come up and talk a little bit more so you'll get to hear firsthand from, from the family and I'll share who they are. So we can talk. This is October the 13th, 1988. And as I said before, we're with Otelia Rayner in a very historic house at 433. State Street, Hudson, New York, and this is part of the Black Legacy of Columbia County. And this is indeed a, not only a historic house, but I think, Otelia, you're sitting in a historic chair in a very historic parlor with a historic photo album, so we've got everything here. Um, what do you remember or having been told about the people who moved here in 1902, was that the Tuckers? That, those were the Tuckers, and the, they had two little nieces came to live with them, that their, their father and mother 
had recently died or was lost in an accident. And uh, Aunt Addie and Uncle John raised them. And it, they had much to tell about the place. And, and Mrs. Pard would like to talk about it. And of course, I was all ears. I'd like to listen. <laughs> so I listened to the stories and the pictures. And mm -hmm. it's paying off now. I'm very happy that I did. Yes. So this is the only way I could pass them on to you, the history that I heard. Yes. I don't know, honestly, all of the people, their names, and etc. But uh, some of it I remember, and I like to talk. Oh. It's very nice. What did Addie and John Tucker do? I, well, Aunt Addie was a seamstress. She sewed. Uh -huh. And I sewed for the neighbors. All the neighbors, whoever needed oh. something made, she made it and made hats and dresses. And then she did all kind of embroidery and beading and tatting and that sort of thing. And she's a churchy lady. She went to church and she taught the children to, oh. well, in the, in the uh, Sunday school and taught them to sing and play the piano and whatever. Oh. And they often visit, visited with her from what I hear. Mm -hmm. And the picture shows, you see, pictures of her in yeah. the backyard with the children and all of that. And it's really interesting. Yes. Yeah. And, and John, um, what did he do? Well, I as well, I know he hunt, and uh, he was a hunter and fish, and then I think he was a gardener more or less. Uh -huh. That he, like a landscapist, he would plant oh, yes. hedges and things and cut them and shape them around. Mm -hmm. And he, and then he was in real estate business to an extent. Uh huh. Buying and exchanging houses and that sort of thing. Oh yes. These are the stories that I've heard about him. Uh huh. And a very interesting man, seemingly. He was he befriended everyone. Everybody loved him. Ah. Uh. And he lost his hand in an accident, and I don't remember the year. But uh, boys were playing with firecrackers, and the little boy was holding one. There was a very strong one, a dynamic one, and he saw it, and he ran to the boy and snatched it. And just at the time, it blew his fingers off. Oh and my hand! Left him with the one hand made. Oh my! So, uh. But it didn't seem to hold him back. Yeah. I understand that Anna Addie made him a glove for it to cover it. And oh, he for went goodness right on sakes. doing things. Yeah. Very busy person and doing. Did he even everything. know the child, do you think? I think he knew of him. He was a neighbor's son, mm -hmm. a child, and yeah. I think he knew of him. I don't know if he knew the family, but. Um, I'll be darned. Yeah. It was just instinct. In just instinct, and he was interested in children, I'm yeah. sure. He didn't want. He knew the kid didn't know the danger, so then he yeah. grabbed it and he got it. Oh. It might have killed a child, you know. Of course. I mean, that, that would blow off a man's hand could just very easily kill a child. Absolutely. So. And not only that, but the firecracker would be closer to the child's, the child's face, face, too. too yes. So it being yes, um, it was a terrible yeah. catastrophe, which he stopped, yeah. and showed great presence of mind. Yeah, yes. so, well, I know that before, when we looked at some of these albums, uh, a lot of things have happened in this house. <laughs> <laughs> there because we have people here who can answer this question live and in person. <laughs> so I would like to introduce, and I'm so excited. So last summer, um, each year I try to grow the, the, the exhibit, and last, last summer I, I did a walking tour, or a shuttle tour, we had a little band. Mm -hmm. And the exhibit, um, the, the Juneteenth exhibit centered on Germantown history because there's they found um, Bard Archaeology Department excavated this parsonage in Germantown and found that they were um, Congolese ancestors enslaved at this parsonage. And then um, after slavery, they bought the parsonage and a black community developed around this family. And the last living person at this house, her end of life was here in Hudson at 433 State Street. Mm -hmm. And that community, what, what was really powerful that made me central on that for the exhibit was the presence of African spirituality carved in the heart of the, mm -hmm. of the, um, the heart that was located in the basement where they lived and did the cooking and, and, and et cetera. And it is rare in the U.S. to find presence of African spirituality that dates back that far. Mm -hmm. And it's right here in Columbia County, mm -hmm. in the heart of Germantown, which, you know, they would like me to say that it's publicly accessible. If you'd like to go see it, the Friends of Germantown, you can go see the house and go into the basement. 
But what I was trying to do was connect the histories of black folks across the county. And so we started at the end of life at this person. And we go to this house, and I have a van. People, my mom was there. Lola was there. There was a whole bunch of us. And so we started there. Um, and I and shout out to Ethan Dick Dickerson, who was a historian who helped us pull this all together. Um, and we get there, there's a bunch of black folks who are out here, we're just looking at this house, and Mr. Bruce sitting over here, we came outside and was just like, what are y'all doing in the yard? And da -da 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 -da. So I'm explaining. And so he jumped in and he's giving all of this context we had no idea and could not give without the lived experience of someone. Um, and so fast forward, you know, I get to not only meet, introduce, and be in conversation with the women who are the keepers of this house and this history. And so I would love and I'm excited to introduce Margaret Mullins. Mm -hmm. Margaret Mullins was born in New Jersey, in Newark, New Jersey, and came to live in Hudson at the young age when her mother, Edith Hazel Pod, who was in the exhibit, out here, mm -hmm. um, moved back to town to work as a nurse at the training school for girls. Miss Rayner was her caregiver. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Margaret and her mother lived with her aunt and uncle Adelaide and John Tucker, who she just explained about, who bought the house in, in 1912. They were gifted the house. They worked for a wealthy person, and um, that person gifted them this house in 1902. So it's been in the family that long. Um, so Adelaide and John Tucker, who owned the State Street home, Edith and her sister Mamie Hazel Hilliard were raised by Uncle John and Aunt Adeline when their mother and father died. Edith was the second black student to graduate Hudson High School in 1918, mm -hmm. and we have that yearbook in the history room. Margaret had a brother, Ernest Jr., who died at a young age at, at the Oak Pond. Margaret, known by friends and classmates as Pootie, or Potty, <laughs> was encouraged to sing by a Hudson High School teacher. Potty sang at concerts and events at local churches and venues in Hudson. Margaret was a graduate of Hudson High School. I believe we have her Hudson High School picture out there in, in the front. Class of 1946, or is it over here? No, it's out in the front. Um, she was editor of the senior yearbook. Upon graduation, Margaret moved to New York City and followed her mother's footsteps and studied nursing. She graduated Bellevue Nursing School in 1951. She became a nurse and worked in numerous departments, ending her career 50 years later as head nurse in the outpatient clinics. Margaret married Alvin Mullings and had two children, Michael and Michelle, who was here with us. Alvin passed away in 1999. Margaret loved Hudson and kept the home, staying frequently over the years with her friends who stayed and lived in the area. Her best friends growing up were Inez White, daughter of Reverend and Mrs. White, Ruth Johnson, daughter of George and Virginia Johnson, Betty Whitback, daughter of Agnes and Arthur Whitback, who is someone's dad, right? She also loved spending time with Otelia Rayner, known as T. Jesse Cooper, who's also in the archive and not digitized, and Marie Parker. Michelle Mullings, Margaret, so this is about Michelle. Margaret and Alvin Mullings' daughter, Michelle, was born in Queens, New York. She spent many summers with her grandmother, Edith. She attended the church services, picnics, and traveled the country with Edith when she retired. Michelle attended Performing Arts High School in New York City and Wesleyan University in Middleton, Connecticut. After graduation, Michelle worked in retail for Lord & Taylor, who oh, I remember Lord & Taylor, and then marketing <laughs> roles at Essence by Mail and Verizon. Michelle enjoyed spending time with Aunt Mamie's grand grandchildren who lived in Arizona and spent summers in Hudson. She also spent time with Agnes Whitbeck's grandchildren. Margaret Mulling's son, Michael, travels with mom to Hudson every time he gets. He loves tending to the Hudson home, going to local uh, diner, and visiting the library. <laughs> so join me in welcoming Margaret and Michelle Mullins. So I gave 
think the first, because I, don't, I didn't share that I would be uh, playing this clip, do you have any uh, thoughts or things that come up as you hear Ms. Rainer speak? Well, uh, she gave a very good history mm -hmm. of everything. Mm -hmm. She really did a marvelous job in the house. Mm -hmm. And we were hoping that she would be well enough to uh, work, you know, as a uh, caregiver. And she was really good at that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really nice mm -hmm. person to have here. Mm -hmm. And she, and um, T, Miss T was, um, worked at the training school. So originally when I heard the full, um, you know, um, video, I didn't realize that um, Miss T, I thought they would work together, but it was so nice that, but that was my grandmother. You know, 433 State Street, I mean, literally everybody came, and that was the one thing that was so great about the community. Everyone came to each other's houses because these ladies could cook. <laughs> I mean, every picnic, I mean, you had peach cobbler, banana pudding, fried chicken, roast or whatever, and they loved to cook. But it was all so elegant, you know, for my grandmother, Miss T, all of them had, just like you see there, you know, the, they had a, the dress or the top of the bottom and an apron and the earrings and perfectly mm. coiffed mm. And, and prepared mm. because that was them, you know, was, you know, was very um, genteel and mm. just really well, classy. But everybody, it was, you know, I think 433 was, you know, a place to kind of come and, and hang out and, and socialize. But it look it looks like um, Aunt Aunt Adelaide or Aunt Addie as you call her and Uncle John were gifted this house. They worked for the Limerick. The Limericks were a bricklaying company, and Miss Limerick, um, Uncle John was a chauffeur because Miss Limerick had a car, so he drove the car as a chauffeur in addition to being a gardener and that sort of thing. And Aunt Addie was described as a seamstress, but she was a cook for Miss, um, Miss Limerick. Mm -hmm. And so the, the house was kept in that regard. And again, you know, there's many times, because the Charles Hotel wouldn't allow um, mm -hmm. blacks to stay there, it literally did. I didn't realize it was in, officially in the Green Book, but it was a place, because there were about five or six bedrooms, mm -hmm. and you know, it could be you know, doctors or politicians or um, you know religious people who were coming into town because you know Albany was nearby too so um, oftentimes they stayed with Aunt Addie and Uncle John. Yeah it and was a greenhouse really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And mom lived mom lived there while um, Grandma Pod was um, at the training school for girls because she was a nurse there. So that's how she got that training. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was just, when I come up on summers, again, it was just, uh, if we weren't there, we would go to the Whitbeck's house. Um, Miss Dago's house was uh, right next door to, um, to Miss Whitbeck's, to the Whitbeck family. Mm. And, um, you know, I hang, hung with um, the grandchildren, Joy. Joy's still up in this area. I believe she's in the Catskills area, Joy um, Chapman, and um, the, their brothers and their mother. The mother, um, Joanne, they, they had like three so sort of kids. Mm -hmm. But again, and then Anders Wigbeck was a riot. She was had a great sense of humor and you know just loved you know spending time with um, with her. Mm -hmm. So, well, I can't say officially that this was in the official green book, but I just say it's ours. <laughs> and it was a greenhouse, so we'll take it. <laughs> Because even the man that was doing re repair in the um, um, post office mm -hmm. was, uh, was a black man, but he mm. couldn't stay at the hotel. He stayed mm -hmm. at our house, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that I knew for a fact because I, you know, saw him there mm -hmm. and whatnot. Yeah. And Mama's not as as. as uh, She's a young and compared to Mother Cross. She'll be 95 in a couple of days. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a good segue into, we'd love to hear some more. I mean, 95 years. <laughs> I don't even know what to do with that number. <laughs> and 
I, I think we're really, we're curious about what life was like here for you in some of those early memories, whatever memories you can, you can think about, you know, I, I'm, I'm guessing. Well, I enjoyed life here. I made life as best I could, mm -hmm. you know, during maybe a time I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't see many black people come into the, the uh, uh, that was very upsetting to me because none of them came. Took Truman to open it up oh, for the army, you know, the army yes. and whatnot. He, uh, I, I admired him no end because uh, I saw no black troops coming in and out of here during the war. But uh, he opened it up, and uh, I was glad for it. But, uh, but you had some nice teachers. I mean, you know, you oh, had that one teacher excellent. at the high school who encouraged you to sing. She's a soprano. And then there was a 65th high school reunion. So I was like, what? I have to go. So I took her and Ruth Johnson, who was my godmother. They were born the exact same day here. And um, they both graduated Hudson High School and born March 19th. And, um, we came to um, Kozel's because Kozel's had the, uh, that was yeah, the spot you where you were. Yeah, you were mm. classmate. You know it just closed? I we heard. Did y'all hear about that? Yeah. 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 All the reunions yeah. were yeah. at Kozel's. Mm -hmm. And then when she came in, they all asked, oh, party, party, you still love singing? She's still singing? Because the church is like on Warren Street, you know, mom would say, oh, I sang there, I sang there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she you know, wanted to pursue that, but then pursue that, the nursing, you mm -hmm. know, became a nurse, mm -hmm. um, which is good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's this photo album that we, we, end, we end on, and she was about to get, um, ask Ms. Rainer to talk more about the photo album. And y'all, mm -hmm. so they sent us mm -hmm. this photo album, and I, I would love for you, and if you've took a moment in the hallway. All of those photos on both sides are from their photo album. Yeah. So if you could share, how old is this album? Well, in the 1900s, 1800s, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, because it says 1902, and they did, um, they were there in the house around 1902. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so a lot of those, because they, I saw some pictures were in the backyard, yeah. on Elm yeah. Street, mm -hmm. and, um, it's amazing. And there was, um, I forget, there was a photography studio that's still been popular for years here. And they were ones that took a lot of the photos, you know. Like the Sullivan Brothers or something like yeah. that. Yeah, so yeah. 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 That, that yeah. picture on the piano is from that. Yeah. From that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. A lot of pictures. Right. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, that was uh, pretty interesting and fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, so thinking, so the photo album, um, could you talk more about what's in it and the people to, to your recollection? Do you have any sense? Because, you know, you get a photo album. If it doesn't have a caption, you know, you're guessing at, at mm -hmm. some of the information. Mm -hmm. But um, do you have any recollection of what we're looking at when we're looking at this photo album? Yes. Uh, we really uh, enjoyed getting it together. Mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. then, Really had a good time getting it together. Mm -hmm. The team was very active in, in making that happen. Making that happen. Because mm -hmm. I think some of the, um, I mean, the Pels, the Van Ness, the White Sides mm -hmm. yeah. were pretty yeah. prominent with families. Yeah. The yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and it looks like friendly. some of the um, some of the young people might have been from the the neighborhood, from the street. You know that um, lived along um, State Street. From what I gather, yeah. yeah. Well, what was State Street like at, at that time? Was it many black families, and how were people interacting with each other, or like you know, was it? I think there was only got one family in, on State Street <coughs> that was our family, and then it built. Yeah. Um, Jesse Cooper lived up on State Street up this way. Five hundred block. block. Yeah. Five hundred block. Okay, yeah. right. Jesse Cooper, yeah. And then Reverend White. Reverend White was, um, yeah. yeah, Inez's uh, my dear friend. Inez's father. He was Reverend. He was the pastor at um, AME, State Street AME Church. And Mrs. White, the picture of Mrs. White is labeled Mrs. White. That's um, Inez's mother. And, um, 
then that's on the school but, and then um Miss um, Louise Parker lived up on State Street. Like, at least yeah. I remember in the 60s. I don't know how long she, yeah. how long she was there. But. Mm -hmm. And then um, the Johnsons, um, Miss uh, Virginia and mm -hmm. George Johnson lived up on State Street. I guess that was the 500 block. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And was the library, the old, the old library that's across the street from the house, was it a library at that time? Yeah, the old building, the white one. The mm -hmm. white, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I came up in the summertime. Um, I used to go to that library. And then up on, um, by where, I guess it's Fish Street, where that huge building that used to be a um, movie theater. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing uh, Mary Poppins there. Mm -hmm. You know, that was like the big, it was a huge, you know, nice um, movie theater at the time. And then mom remembers, um, she was telling me when they were young and used to go to that movie theater, they used to, um, when you bought your ticket and saw a movie, you could get these red plates, and we still have them at the house. <laughs> 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 my aunt and I, we sat in the uh, beer and the collecting them, what do you call them, the red ones, the red ones, the red and that um, the chair that Miss um, um, T is sitting in is still there. And I didn't know that story, but it looks like it was um, Abraham Lincoln. It was a replica is what they yeah. said. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 But yeah. more for the rocket chair, where his was a, mm -hmm. a seated chair. But um, that, that's still there. It's, and yeah. you know, the clock is still there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could you talk more about the, the house itself? Because when we were peeking in the, when we were trespassing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it seemed like it was, it was um, the furnishings seemed like they were vintage. Like everything seemed like it was, you know, kept from a particular time period and, and kept that way. Could you talk more about like the house um, and, and, and its setup? Yeah. Yeah, I would say the like the rocking chair. I mean, that's the one thing. I, all the guests would sit in that chair, but then there were you know other chairs and mm -hmm. uh, surrounding it. And then the dining room had these um beautiful, nice um, um chairs, very elegant um, chairs. And then uh, that was where those great Sunday dinners were. Where, you know, anytime that um, my the, grandma. There's was a table there that is a hundred years old, mm. and it. Works. I don't know how it works, but it does. It's a hundred years old. Yeah, yeah. Wow. They took it out and they have yeah. the fire and everything uh, and, 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 and grainy. Uh -huh. And so that worked there. And it's really wonderful. Yeah. So we kept there's a number of antiques there still. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there was a clock on there was a, a cuckoo clock there that literally, you know, was um, kept and restored and somebody would always help, you know, kind of regulate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the fire. So what what are some of the things that this house has gone through and the people that have come through over the years? I, I would imagine it's you there's a lot of history in terms of its oh, own yes. evolution. So a lot of the, uh, the people that we met as they came through, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. they were really into this. They enjoyed themselves because there was a lot of good cooking, mm -hmm. and, you know, made them happy. And, mm -hmm. and really. Any, anyone that sticks out in your memory in terms of folks that came through or Well, standing? there's that uh, man that was working on the, uh, uh, the uh, post office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, knew him well. Mm -hmm. He couldn't stay in the hotel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was a black man. Mm -hmm. And it says it looks like there was history. Mm -hmm. I think we have to do some more digging to confirm mm -hmm. that Aunt Addie was a niece of um, the Dubois. Mm -hmm. WB Dubois, so we need to double, ch uh, you know, triple check that, but mm -hmm. that's some of the, you know, history. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if he came to visit at all, but. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I'll open it up, because we have, we have a couple of panelists coming up, but I wanted to see if anyone here had any questions for mm -hmm. the Mullings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Nice to see you guys up here. Um, I, I just want to know, I mean, I know it wasn't that many black people here at the time, but how did the white population, did they embrace you? Did, what was that like for you? Well, 
I seem to have had a way of getting along with people, you know, that mm -hmm. were part of my nature to, you know, get along with people. And uh, I think I did that well, really, you know. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed meeting people, enjoyed the conversing with them, and just enjoyed going to school here, really. I really enjoyed school, yeah. very and much so. He had become the senior editor of the year yeah. while Kato was, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and that was a pretty good yeah. <laughs> thing at the time. Yeah. yeah. That was a pretty good thing at the time. And then I came up in summers during the 60s, so I, you know, it, I felt it was kind of a community, but maybe I was insulated because everybody was so friendly. It really was family. I mean, there was hugging, and it just, it was, was great. And I remember um, my grandmother, it just seemed like they were just such good people. You know, yes. my grandmother was well-respected. Um, now she, um, there was a picture of 1953 where she is one of, I guess five nurses at the training school, and um, she was the one black person there. Mm -hmm. But I guess I don't know. Folks just seemed to. I I, I didn't sense the tension, but mm -hmm. my myself. And yeah. Did, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And then um, my grandmother was there at the training school when Ella Fitzgerald was there. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. she was. Oh, you know, wow. She used for girls if you. <coughs> Think about it. They yeah. were sent there for being abused. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there are different stories. There are mm -hmm. different stories. And she was there because she was abused. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Different stories. That's yeah. why she was sent to that school. Right. And so they had nurses. And abusers, but then Ella was there because yeah. she was an abused person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. um, so the terrible ones. Right. Yeah. And then we labeled them delinquent. Yes. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. They were able to do inquiries. Mm -hmm. But I guess there was something. I just said, you know, I can't, I mean, maybe I didn't experience it, you know, coming up. I guess maybe, you know, okay, I was in New York City growing up in Queens, so maybe there was a little more here <laughs> when I came up here. But. That's a question I have. Um, so you would be considered a middle class family. How was your relations with other black people who were not of your rank and stature? Was that still a, a community that was close, or was it a little bit um, afar? I don't know, because everybody, everyone that um, you interacted with ha had a home. You know, I think mm -hmm. everyone, I guess I'm pretty much um, like the whites were, they had their home. I think um, the Johnsons may have rented for a bit of time. Miss Cooper yeah. was by, so maybe she rented. Yeah. Um, I guess, I don't know, maybe maybe I didn't sense it. I Maybe I didn't feel it. I'm not sure if you felt mm -hmm. any, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I enjoyed growing up here in Hudson. It was a, a, a very friendly town and uh, I had no problems, you know, you just fit it in and did the best you could. What happened? Very nice. Question in the back. Um, when did you first start to feel like Hudson was your home and not just a place you lived or a place that was kind of in the background of your life? Well, all, all along growing up, you know, I felt at home here. I really did. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. I just think as um, teenagers and young people, they may have wanted to, you know, go to the big city, so to speak. I think that, you know, drove it drove them to maybe go to the to, yeah. to leave Hudson, mm -hmm. you know, for maybe different opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was one of those kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was one of those kids. Mm -hmm. What year did you graduate again? Um, um, the what? What year did you graduate? Oh, and what was it? 1946. 1946. Yeah. 46. And that was the, wait, is that our elementary school now? I can't, I can't keep track of that building. When I, so the middle school, when I got here, what used to be the high school was the middle school. Yeah. So I went to high school, I'm sorry, I'll tell y'all my age, from like 80, the middle school, I was there like eight, the 86 through like 88, and then the now high school um, 
I don't think was I don't think it was existed at the time, but I was told that the middle school that I was going to used to be the high school, high school. on mm -hmm. the big one on yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And the junior high, mm -hmm. we went to junior high, which is on the corner there now on uh, mm -hmm. Fifth Street. On Fifth Street. Fourth 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 Street. Intermediate or elementary now. Elementary yeah. now, yeah. yeah. I believe they still have statues of, of a kid reading a book at 401 State Tree if you yes. look up. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and an owl for knowledge, yeah. Mm -hmm. What were some of the other schools, like elementary schools that you went to? Because we do have some history Across here. The, uh, mm -hmm. Junior high mm -hmm. was 4th Street School okay. with elementary. The county building up on 6th Street, that was an elementary school. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, Charles Williams, and then uh, Allen Street. Mm -hmm. And there's some history over here that can give you all some context about the schools. You'll see some pictures of theirs of all of those schools mm -hmm. um, labeled. And there's a map over here that in the 1860s or the 40s, I believe, they called it the colored school. And it's on this map here with those mm -hmm. arrows. So I just want to point that out that then became the church. So there's a lot of history on that, you know, this yeah. is <laughs> uh, there, Are there any other questions? Yeah. What places did you play or spend time when you were kids besides school and other people's houses? Were there playgrounds that you went to? Well, playgrounds and uh, picnics mainly. Yeah. The church gave us a lot of picnics. Yeah. Well, not to Comic State Park. Mm -hmm. We used to go there quite a bit. Yeah, yeah and I think there were, um, yes, because I think pretty much there were, um, you know, you go to each other's houses and then the picnics were for the most part. And, um, you know, Warren Street at that time, they had little shops. You know, now the, you know, we've got these fancy, you mm. know, antique stores and whatnot. It used to be, I think it was a Woolworths or something, but, yeah. you know, so you did, you know, shop at the, um, the small uh, shops and boutiques. And then um, they had a lot of, um, took a lot of trips. So my grandmother, when she retired, took me, I was her little travel companion. Mm -hmm. And I know Miss Cooper, Miss Marie, and a bunch of them that would have these um, cruises and whatnot. So we, I would go on the cruises with them. And um, so it was, it was good. And you know, I think just to answer your question too is, I think, Hudson has always been like home. I mean, for us to, you know, we come back every time I, we can. You know, my brother, unfortunately, couldn't be here, but he's like, well, when can we get up to Hudson? Mm -hmm. And I get this from mom. You know, it's unfortunate that some of her dear friends, you know, passed on. Like, she's one of the last surviving um, that yeah. come back. But, I mean, this is, this is home. I mean, I, I was thinking, like, boy, should I try to come back here, you know, to stay? Yeah. Because I miss the Wickback, Benny. Benny yeah, Benny, Benny Chapman. 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 They would, um, you they know, my friends. Yeah, they always love to come for us to come and see them and everything. And they always, you know, anniversaries, and we'd come back and weddings and that sort of thing. So that's this, yeah, this is really is home. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I don't want to minimize any, you know, racial tension or whatever, but I guess maybe I was, you know, insulated from it perhaps, which is kind of weird. It's like I said, in, in Queens and New York, you know, we were, there could be some things, but um, it was just a very, you know, loving community, maybe from within the, the folks who you were close with. It was just, you, so you maybe you were insulated and protected, but. And then Bruce, I mean, our family has known each other for, for decades, um, you know, we always, you know, enjoyed going to the movies. Every time we come up, we let, you know, Bruce know we would come go to the movies and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was there any um, uh, lasting thoughts or comments that, you know, we haven't asked you, but you want to share with us? Coming, you know, coming from your history. Uh, it's interesting. Well, one, I guess one little story too is like she, mom, and Aunt Ruth, actually like it's because it's so weird. You can come from New York City and then two hours away, you know, there's farmland. Mm -hmm. You know, they used to pick cherries, strawberries, and whatnot for. 
pennies. Um, uh, yeah, we, was, yes. we were down, they didn't need people waiting for, by a bus, a bus and whatnot. We were the people <laughs> <laughs> so, waiting uh, for the bus. So, uh, <laughs> they didn't have uh, migrant workers. Right. We were. Right. Yeah. 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 Get up four in the morning mm -hmm. and go and be at the bus picking, picking fruit. Mm -hmm. They didn't have people waiting then. Yes, yes. We were the ones waiting for. Uh, we were the ones they were waiting for. <laughs> we are the ones we are waiting for. <laughs> I just have one more question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned when you were sitting next to me about the men that weren't able to join the army. Was well, there a big difference between men and women and how they interacted at that time that you were growing up? And growing up, well, you know, as I say, it was very sad not to see black men coming into this, uh, uh, you know, into the uh, armory. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, it was sad to me, you know, because everything was going on in the world and what have you and what not, and there were no black men coming in and out of this place then. It took Truman to take, you know, to, to organize and get things started. But, uh, so you remember when this building oh, yes. was an act of armory? Oh, it was active. Tanks. Yeah. Tanks. 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 outside. Yeah. 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 Tanks would be rolling in. And the best corn in the world. I mean, I live in New Jersey now, and the corn is pretty good, but there's nothing like some Hudson. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> she brings like everybody wants to be like I don't know about forty years of corn to everybody. Mm -hmm. Tomatoes every time we come up. Mm -hmm. oh, so good nothing like some good old Hudson corn. All right, mm -hmm. yeah, Hudson's home. Tastes like home. Wow. Yeah. I want to thank you both for coming up here, for oh, sharing you. your life, this your story, for, you know. Yes. A lot of this wouldn't be possible without you. Um, so as I mentioned, the Cross family goes back generations. So and if you were able to get over to that corner um, over there where Wesley is standing, you'll see one, two, three. I mean, there are about seven generations in now in Hudson, I believe. Um, and it begins with um, great grandma Styles and it ends with Jaden Cross, who was about 20-something. He's this generation. <laughs> Um, and, you know, naming this, you know, a, a dialogue across generations, I really wanted to um, have m multiple modalities in which that can, like, express itself. And there's nothing like the tradition of conversation and call and response and the oral tradition that we have in our community. And so I am really honored um, and grateful that these two um, men of this family were willing to come up here and be in conversation with each other across mm -hmm. generation, in conversation with their own history. Mm -hmm. And so join me in welcoming Mr. Quentin Cross and Mr. Jada Cross. So I'm really not gonna say much. I'm gonna ask maybe one or two questions just to get it going, to get a little bit more context of who they are and then Mr. Jaden is going to take it away and just, you know, talk to his elder. And um, so in preparation for this, I asked Jaden to spend time with the archive and he listened to his ancestors. And then I didn't, you know, we don't short on time, but I, was, I wanted to listen to a clip of Quentin, 
who's in the Oral History Summer School Archive. So the clothes that Brenda talked about that's in conversation with the Black Collection. And so, and it's Quentin, his mother, his brother, his uncle, and um, it's about, I believe, five of these interviews, that, and I gave him all of them. It's just like, whatever you, wherever you want to go, whatever you want to listen to, whatever you want to watch, and I just gave him some guiding questions. It's just like, just sit with it. What are your reflections? What does it mean to you to be able to access your ancestors in this way? This is rare. I have no, my, I mean, I remember my great-grandmother a little bit, but, um, and I went down south once and got to see a photo album and talk to the family historian down there and learn so much that filled the hole I didn't even know I had. So when you live with that absence, you don't even know that it's an absence. And so, um, so Jaden sat with it, and Jaden's an amazing young person. He goes to uh, Columbia Green Community College. He's in a lot. He's a photographer. He's an artist. He's a freestyle fanatic. Um, <laughs> and y'all know Mr. Quentin Cross. And so um, I just want to open it up for Quentin to say some words. He has some things on his heart that he wants to share. And then Jaden, you can share. And then y'all can be in conversation with each other. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> I just want to center the allyship in this moment because it wasn't easy to get to this point. Um, I want to thank Emily um, because the fact is that we've been at, we had been asking for this archive for such a time, mm -hmm. but we were rejected multiple times. Mm -hmm. That's the truth of the matter. Um, <coughs> and so e Emily joined us, and that's how we were able. They were sitting in boxes for years. It's in a basement, sitting there. But some of us knew they were there because we had copies of these videos. So I thank Emily for joining us and being a cooler head than myself. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and uh, getting getting this out to the people. So that's that's what I wanted to center. It's very important um, for me. Because, like as you see, I'm like standing next to my great grandmother. Mm -hmm. But coming here these last few days, um, I never met my great grandfather. But in a couple of those articles, they, it said he was from Hudson. Mm -hmm. So we go back even more. So looking, trying to find what that story <laughs> is, um, because I I never knew. Mm -hmm. And I think we have one more generation. Payday, yeah, um, and all of, we have another generation after Jaden, who's here in Hudson. So I just thank you all for coming and let my nephew do his thing. Thank you guys for having me. Um, this is this is big for me. I, I when Tanya says that it's a hole that you don't know that you're able to fill, I, I really felt that because. I wasn't around everyone growing up, so to say. I wasn't able to hear those firsthand stories of what actually was going on, of what it was truly like to live here. And so when I, when I came here, I, I tried to kind of fill that hole. And I was able to in some ways, but in Tanya's um, Juneteenth, that kind of opened me up to a completely different perspective of, it, of actually seeing it in a format that's livable, movable, mm -hmm. how they lived, what they liked, what they grouped around. And mm -hmm. it made me think about what I can what I can do to make it so that people don't have to go through the circumstances that I went through of not knowing the past that I come through. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm just happy that I've had this opportunity to listen to these stories and be able to visualize it in a complete perspective that I, when, when I was young, I wouldn't even think that was able to, that was limited options to me. So thank you guys for having me, and I'm really, really grateful for being here. So I guess to you, Jaden, you've engaged the archive and listened to your ancestors. Um, can you share some of what came up for you and some of your reflections? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the, the biggest thing was the connection that they had. They, it was the sense of community that was in Hudson and in the community of, through them. But they enjoyed the little things. They enjoyed the things that I might look at as wouldn't matter, but to them that's what life was. And 
for me, the, the times of life make me think that, oh, just go to my car, grab, grab my, go to school, it takes 10 minutes, that's it. And then to actually be able to hear the stories of the same distance that people had to go through, and they had to walk it every day. They had to take a complete journey. Uh, I locked my keys in my car today <laughs> at school, and I, I had no idea. It, it made me think, like, what would I do? What, what would I do in this situation? Like, am I gonna, it's only 3.3 miles. These are walks that people had to do on every day. And, and they had to find enjoyment out of things that I wouldn't see enjoyment out of if I wouldn't be able to. <laughs> The technology that we have is just the attention span so much shorter. We're we're able to go from one thing to the next, and those you talked to, they talked about the picnics a lot, and those picnics, those are things where you tell stories amongst each other, you learn from each other, you learn the experiences of each other, and continue that legacy through the years, and that's something that is very stuck out to me, like that that process of life in a smaller sense, and in the smaller scale and being able to look at it not just in in pictures and this happened a hundred years ago and being able to actually understand that a hundred years ago isn't that long ago and the, the change of technology isn't that far. It just happened in this small period of time but they were able to thrive and to enjoy their lives through what they had. And I'm really grateful for that. I'm really grateful for that experience of hearing the difficulties, but not the difficulties, but the the prospering through those difficulties. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what are some questions you have? I'm going to step back and let you. Ask your questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's a a great experience to have someone and to be an elected official at such an early age to have be around what's going on. And I just I wonder if going through these years, do you think that fostering communities is more something that needs to be changed in policy or if it's individuals about the community that need to work amongst each other to find the sense of community. Great question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you could share for people who don't know this aspect of your, your history just a little bit about <laughs> so yeah, I think there is there are times to come together and times to build community around um, common interests. My goal is black liberation, right? We've been down, we've been out, we've been for so long, we need to help ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And that's what I fight for, that's what I believe in. Mm -hmm. um, I'll come to the table, but we, we've been through a lot in this community. Yes. We've been through a lot, you know. I always wonder about urban renewal mm -hmm. and how the black people stayed down here yeah. and the whites got to the boulevards. Mm -hmm. How that happened, mm -hmm. what did it mean? How, you know, because many of those, the folks of color, from what I'm told, own their homes, why did they end up in the high rise and not on the boulevards, you know? So I, those things, I think about those things. I think about the role our family played in community, who they worked for. Um, my grandmother um, was a founder of the Black Arts and Cultural Festi Festival, which is now precinct and cult for that Miss Mosley runs, right? People talk about my grandfather. Now, both of these folks were present in my life because when they got older, my mom took care of them until they passed, right? Like, they moved into our home. So my mom was the store for that. Interestingly enough, I think I'm like a six or seven year difference with my, my next sibling. Like, my great-grandmother lived in 411, my grandmother lived in 411, and me and my mom 
we lived in 411. So it's a thing, like so. When I, when I, you know, I'm not supposed to talk about the that time in my life, but when I listened to these videos, like I was. I was spoiled and I was bad. So, you know, <laughs> so I was like, so when we, when some of these folks here, like I know, I know, I was a shallow kid and I was so bad. Like my mom would make me go to church every day. So I was at Ma Rainer house. I was like, listen, my loveless, like I was at these people's house like every day, like cleaning up or doing something. These are people who informed my life because when my mom got off work, she dragged me like, nope. <laughs> They're coming with me to Bible study or to this thing or that. So these are random people in my life. Um, when I got in trouble at a young age and came home and needed to get back in Hudson High School, they, I mean, Hudson City School District, they wouldn't let me back in. But somebody from the training school, one of the mothers, knew somebody who worked there who was the deputy commissioner of education by that time, but met them. They were working together at the training school. 20 years prior, was able to make the call. That was Miss Blanks made the call yes. to someone in the education department. Yes. That got me in. Yes. Yeah, so like those things, those things matter, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, I got elected at a, a young age. I got elected right out of high school. I didn't know. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know. <laughs> Could, what have I just, Could have been there. Could have been there. Could have been, right? No, wasn't. It wasn't my life path. No. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that that was that was tough because I was 18 and I was like one of a few blacks and nobody really wanted me there and I won and. <laughs> You know, I faced a lot of adversity in those moments. Mm -hmm. But any, to any of the young people, as long as you study up, you can run circles around folks. Mm -hmm. So I studied up and I ran circles around everybody. And mm -hmm. you know, within a year, I was, I was centered in that. But my mom served on the city council. My uncle was the first black elected to the county board of supervisors. They were public servants. I was a politician. Mm -hmm. so it's a difference. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, so that informed me, and it, it, it's taught me a lot around this community, like of like like just how things work and how mm -hmm. things still work, mm -hmm. right? And what does it mean to be there? You know, I was told by a mentor of mine, Staley Keith. Mm -hmm. um, when he started working at the training school, he wasn't allowed to live below fourth. Mm -hmm. That was the rules for the black professionals. Mm -hmm. He had to be up this way. I don't know if that's true. I, well, I know it's true because he said it, that's my man, right? <laughs> but, you know, I don't know if that's been people's experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's some old timers here. I don't know, Gary. <laughs> you, know, you ain't that old, but I'm just saying. <laughs> but what has been people's experience, you know, in this transition, the continued transition of community? But one thing's for sure, most people of color are still in the same part of town. Mm. And I don't know if that's a good thing. Mm. Mm. You spoke in your oral history about um, the community organizations that you were doing, um, SBK, um, and just the impact that it had. The, at the time, it was doing really well. And, and I just wonder, do you continue to see growth through community organizations, like groups like that? Or do you think that there's a different way to go about connecting the community? And also, do you see it continuing to grow right now? Are you like at a point where you can see con the community growing? Mm -hmm. I think it's important to have community organizations. You know, at, mm -hmm. you know, at 19 I was in the Masons and I enjoyed that and I enjoyed service or have you. I enjoyed working with Hala and with the Columbia this or that for education and all of those things. It's very important to have common interests, right? In terms of our work, 
it's extremely important, right? We're, to, we're talking about housing and helping people with housing. Um, our impact is felt more statewide and nationally, though. Like the work we do has national implication. We're at the table, um, like as a model for rural communities. You know, we're at the table able to, it, it allows you, I don't even know how to say this time yet. <laughs> we are able to do the work we want to do, be unapologetic, support who we want to support, because we have no local control. We have no local control. And that, and that sort of matters. You yes. don't have to bend to the will exactly. of others That's right. in the way that That's right. some folks around here do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak my mind and say what I want to say, because at the end of the day, I can go to the Movement for Black Lives, and they're going to take care of us, mm -hmm. right? But community is important. Coming together is important. Like being able, we, we talk about bridging the, the gap of social distance. I may not know you, right? But there might be, there's something that we can come together around. Mm -hmm. It seems like we can come together around, like it seems like a lot of people on war street being displaced now. <laughs> <laughs> How do we come together and fight the fight together about the, the, the raising rents on all sides, whether commercial or residential, right? Like who's starting those conversations? Yeah. That's something where we can come together around. Mm -hmm. Are we gonna be back to like the 90s? But this time we're gonna buy the buildings. We ain't gonna just let them. Right. <laughs> we ain't gonna let them go. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I think that was the big thing that when I was watching their their interviews, it was the smaller parts, the the small get togethers that were the big things in, in their lives. So I wonder or I I ask, do you think what was it like for you to be able to sort of experience that, experience your elders pouring into you in that manner, experience the seeing people older than you in affluential positions? Do you think that sort of sculpted you into wanting to do what you do? I'm not going to tell you what my cards say. I'm not going to tell you what my chart says. <laughs> it tells a lot, but I'm going to say, um, just being able to be around my grandma, who, like, if you look at that picture back there where everybody, like, like, we pretty much all went to my grandmother's house after school. There was a mill there. Like, I'm talking about all my cousins, and we all lived in a general area. So when you grow up in that type of way, like, there is a connection to family that really can't be broken because you had you know, the matriarch, whatever. My grandfather was there also. Like, I remember my great-grandmother. I remember her funeral. I remember, the, like, I had a choice whether to go to the funeral or go to the Catskill Game Farm. <laughs> That's how, you know? Um, I remember the lesson she gave. I, I, it's, it's just something about being able to have that legacy. And it's also some I gotta say this, but it's also why like I reconnected to like my paternal side at 18. Like I'll tell you the story. I found I found my, my father in the yellow pages and went down to North Carolina and uh, I had grandparents, I had aunts and uncles, I had great I had a whole family, I still do, and was able to reconnect. And I felt like I wouldn't have had that journey had it, you know, my, my grandparents had, had, if I didn't have that relationship, if they didn't go with the ancestors, right? Like, I wanted to have that connection. I, had, I was able to spend a lot of time um, with my family down there and also um, getting closure. Because a lot of times when you have these things, you never know why people do what they do. And like, you know, I, I truly believe that, you know, family over everything, like family is so important to us. You don't even know, I used to come, like I knew you from when you were small, I was the only one that used to go to Massachusetts 
in the summers. I get dropped off. I know your mom. You know, go past the liquor store, take the left down the way. That's where you used to live, man. Like, I'm, I'm telling you, like, I'm, like my old, my your dad is the oldest. I'm the youngest, so and we're the boys. So I got to have that that connection. Like you probably wouldn't know that. Like, but yeah, I knew you. I knew you from from the baby with the big head. <laughs> Something that I really connected with too, because at first I didn't I didn't know like what I was coming into when I because I think it was I don't know exactly how many years it was, but it was a good amount of time where I, I didn't come up here for a bit. And I remember the time when well, let me let me flashback a little bit. <laughs> there was one memory in Hudson and it kind of got spoke about in this community and I was I don't even know how old I was, probably like five through seven must have been and it was at the churches it was it was i think it was easter that i came up for and that sense of community is something that i really felt and i really felt in my heart because i didn't understand it from where i was mm -hmm. i didn't understand what it what it meant to have people who who looked like me so to say people who were in the same genetics the same mm -hmm. that, that's one thing that i i really gathered from from their interviews, it's the small things, how their body language is, how they react to things, the, the, the way they speak, the way they enunciate things. It's just commonalities that I can see through my other ancestors, and it's, it's really nice. And I just, <coughs> where was I going with this? Um, <laughs> um, and then when I came back, that was, that was the big thing. The big thing was, where am I coming into? What, I had no idea. I'm 17, 18 years old, and I came back, and it was nothing but love. It was, what do you want for food? We got you on this. We got you on that. Just, just name it. And that's something that I, I really, I really appreciated, but I couldn't appreciate at the moment because I didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. And so, I, 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 I wonder for you, how. How do you see the next steps going for bridging that gap of community? Where, where can you see, or for someone like me who didn't originally get it, how can I gain more access into that, into the, the family life? And can I ask you what is your mother's ethnicity? Um, my mom's white. Okay. I just didn't understand the statement you made. I just wanted mm. to understand the statement. I think you just keep moving, man. Like I, it's gonna come. You, I look at you and I see you on the street. You walk up and down the street like my grandfather did, and like Uncle Ed do. Like you, you have those. You have certain characteristics, like of them. You know, you have it. You have the. You have the length of my pop and, and the movements. Um, it's just there. You have to. You have to. Just move to your own beat, man, and and and, and find your way and your niche. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's like everybody ain't gonna do the same things. Some of us are <laughs> trying to do other things. I'm trying to build a school now. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. 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 That's my next thing. Right. Um, but yeah, just like keep going. Stop down at the church, like you know, full circle moment. Alan Williams. Is my first cousin. His mm -hmm. mom is Dorothy Cross. That's my aunt. Mm -hmm. You know, all right? Like, and she, how old is she, Kai? She will be 97 in June. So, we gotta get her over and <laughs> us, right? So it's, it's, it's those full circle moments, these, these times where you never, listen, I look at that yearbook and I'm like, First of all, I looked at the yearbook and was like, everybody on these two pages is still alive. Mm -hmm. So that's a plus, right? Let's start there, yes. right? Yes. Secondly, I looked at, like, there is something about Hudson that brings people together, like, mm -hmm. in these, these ways. I'm still super close to, like, majority of the people in the yearbook, if they ain't cops. <laughs> <laughs> And I still, you know, I still march with them if there's some injustice, right? <laughs> um, 
but you know, just just making this your home, like making this like find like doing what you want to do, like finding your niche in this town that has so much going on, right? There's so much going on here, but so little. Mm-hmm. All right. Having a meeting place, I'm about to open open after hours. <laughs> we need a meeting place, right, black folks? That's you right. Know? That's As right. you go around, y'all, y'all want to help us out. Black folks need a meeting place yes, in this indeed. community. We don't have one. Mm-hmm. All right. That's true. You know? That's absolutely. Let's get to work. Tell the assembly we, mm-hmm. we need a meeting place. Mm-hmm. Uh, just places to come together, understanding this is the meeting place right now, right? Mm-hmm. This is the meeting place, but we need something that is ours. Those such of things. Um, what do you think you were able to learn through this, through through looking at at this light? Were there things that you didn't know that you were able to to grab from this history, or where do you think that you like had a lot of it kind of told down to you through through the years? I think. I have two points to that. I think what I've learned, like, I go back to, like, who my great-grandfather was. I don't know this guy. But it, gave, it gives me a sense of how I move in this city. Like, it's my city, right? Like, it gives you, like, the, our ancestors was here. Like, we were here. We, we firm foundation here. I think about that. And then I think about when I became a mason, and I got my book. And the book was, my first book was Reverend Allen's, right? My second book was my grandfather's, right? But who would have known? It's not like, so how we pass down history, how we hold on to history, and then understanding like folks like Lola and Smooth, and I see, the brother Tyrone, don't throw, don't, don't throw anything away. <laughs> like, don't throw it away. Like, hold on to it. Because we need moments like these. So many people, we, we lose so much history by people, you know, passing on and we just throwing it out, right? Then you save some stuff, keep the stuff, right? You know, probably could do a whole archive on the Boys and Girls Club with the different pieces or whatever and what it meant in those times. Yeah. Because I was almost crying when I heard Ma Raymond's voice. Because that was a voice that was with me. Come you know, here, sit right here, and take this butterscotch and shut up. Right? She can say no more, but it's just like, it's, it's, it matters. So, um, what? Should we take one or two questions from the audience? I can't tell from the time. Um, you've been over. Hmm? You know you've been over. <laughs> All right, so we won't. Um, well, I want to. I want to thank these. Join me in thanking.